Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Sabah Nakhed. Happy Saturday. Um, welcome to day three of PAC's annual virtual conference. Um, thank you for, for spending your Saturday morning or after, I don't know what time <laughs> what time zone everyone is in, but I think we're all in the morning time. So uh, we're very grateful that you're spending your Saturday morning with us, um, learning about, about Palestine and healing and continuing all of the great conversations we've had over the last two days. Um, I'm just going to jump right in and get us started because we have a really great um, conversation, um, you know, lined up for this morning. Um, and it's my pleasure to hand the virtual mic over to our two moderators for today, um, Barry Mahmoud and Sana Sheikh, who are going to introduce our amazing speaker and also moderate the Q&A session. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome everyone to PAC Conference 2022. My name is Barry Mahmoud and joining me as well in moderating is Sana Sheikh. We're both students at Rutgers New Brunswick and we're both organizers with the Students for Justice in Palestine at Rutgers New Brunswick campus. Hi everyone, my name is Sana Sheikh and today we are presenting our session titled Stories from Palestine. To properly advocate for Palestine in the U.S., we must understand the reality Palestinians face on the ground in Palestine and uplift and honor their stories. This session invites speakers from Palestine to share not only their everyday reality and lived experiences, but also what they need from the rest of the world. Joining us today is Dr. Ramzi Barud. Dr. Barud is a journalist and the editor of the Palestine Chronicle. He's also the author of six wonderful books and his latest, which is co-edited with Ilan Papi, is Our Vision of, for Liberation, Engage Palestinian Leaders and Intellectuals Speak Out. And we will be linking his uh, new book uh, soon. Um, Dr. Barud is a non-resident senior research fellow at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs at Istanbul Sabah Din Zayim University in Turkey. Dr. Barud will speak for 40 minutes and then we will have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Please feel free to type out your questions throughout the session and we will get to them all at the end in the order they were received. And now without further ado, Dr. Barud, please take it away. I uh, thank you very much, uh, Barry and uh, Sana and Abir and everyone uh, involved with the Palestinian American Community Center uh, and, and those who are tuned in today, I really do hope that we can um, not only have you listen to me, but rather have um, a, a meaningful conversation afterwards. In fact, I will try to, if possible, and sometimes I just, you know, cannot control myself, but um, try to keep it, you know, at half an hour or so. Uh, so that we can uh, prolong our conversation and the questions and answers and, and hear your comments as well. First, I would like to um, just briefly address the issue of why, uh, why, why is it important for Palestinians to tell their stories? Why is it important for Palestinians to claim um, not only their share in the, in the narrative on Palestine and Israel, but also the centrality uh, in that narrative as well. Trying to answer that question could also explain uh, pretty much most of the choices I have made in my life as an academic and as a writer and as a journalist. It is a question that I have been chasing for so many years, starting at, you know, um, you know, my, you know, being a teenager, growing up in a refugee camp in Gaza, uh, and kind of perceiving the world um, and the story of Palestine and the history of Palestine from the viewpoint of the refugees in my refugee camp. Uh, my refugee camp is called Nusayrat, and it, uh, it is the largest in size, second largest in population. Now you have nearly 100,000 refugees living in that camp. And, and my existence in the camp was centered around, uh, to the left of my house, we had the martyrs graveyard. That's where most of the martyrs, mostly young people, uh, especially those killed during the first Intifada, 1987, were buried there. Uh, right to the front of my house was the, uh, the, the uh, 
Martyr's uh, Mosque, later on called the Isdudin al Qassam Mosque. Um, and, and all around me were refugees. And every one of these refugees, um, you know, kind of referenced his existence uh, or defined his existence based on the place from which they were uh, ethnically cleansed from Palestine in 1948. So we lived in refugee camps, but we almost did not recognize that existence. Uh, when people asked me as a child, where are you from? My answer was always, I am from Beit Daras. Beit Daras is one of the nearly 500 Palestinian villages that were destroyed by Israel or by Zionist militias in 1947, 1948 in what we Palestinians call the Nakba or the great catastrophe. Uh, despite of the passing of years, generation after generation, we are still linked to that history. And we still see ourselves as people who are rotating around the identities of these villages. Now, the vast majority of these villages do not exist. They have been erased entirely. Uh, and, and in their places, you either have uh, Israeli cities, towns, villages, or just empty spaces. But there is something else that happened to that erasure of Palestinian reality, physical reality on the ground. History as well has been erased. Israel has spent so much time and resources and from the very, very early on to ensure the erasure of anything Palestinian. And they've been doing it ever since and they continue to do it until this day and they will continue to do it until the day that Palestinians recover their national rights and their human rights, and they manage to uh, redeem all of these injustices at one point in the future. Because as long as Zionism is there, as long as that process of the complete erasure of the other uh, will continue. Uh, to give you just one of numerous examples, in 2013, in specifically in May 2013, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz revealed a document, um, uh, a document uh, that, and, and I have here the, the name of that document. Uh, uh, it's GL18-17028. Seems something bureaucratic, irrelevant, an old government piece of paper. Why is it important to us Palestinians? It's, it's important because sometime in the early 1950s, the Israelis were struggling trying to reconstruct history or rather fabricate history. And one of the issues that they couldn't deal with successfully is what happened to the Palestinian refugees? You know, those hundreds of thousands of people who were driven out of their homes. What is the official Israeli response to why the Palestinian refugees have become refugees? Now, Israel was struggling at the time. There was a, a refugee, you know, humanitarian catastrophe happening not just in the West Bank, Gaza, but throughout the region as well. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, of course, Egypt, even Iraq and other countries. And there was international pressure as to the need to uh, uh, compensate or, you know, allow the refugees to go back home. So that document, was a request made by Ben Gurion, the Israeli prime minister at the time, to Israeli historians and intellectuals. We need a unified response to as why the refugees have left. Now notice how historians, like when you, whenever you see a reference to the Nakba in today's news, in American media, in British media, European media, there's always that reference to, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who have uh, fled fled or uh, uh, driven out. The term fled there is, is very, very important. And it's almost like, it's almost like kind of a fixed term in describing how the Palestinian refugees became refugees. And the term fled here is related to that Israeli fabrication of history, that Zionist fabrication of history, uh, because it basically said, well, how about this? We would say, when we are asked about the refugees, that they have fled because they were asked by the Arab armies through radio 
to escape. Well, therefore, it is their fault. And that became kind of more or less the official and unified Israeli response. Has very little to do, if anything, to do with reality whatsoever. But that became the official Zionist response. And therefore, because of the existing biases towards the Zionists in the media, that became the Western acknowledgement of what happened during the Nakba. Now, I don't want to veer off a bit too much, but let me relate this to something that is happening right now in the Ukraine. I don't want to talk about the politics of the conflict itself, but just to tell you, according to international humanitarian groups, they say over 3 million Ukrainians have fled outside the country, right? And about 6 million are internally displaced refugees within Ukraine itself. It's actually more than this. These are the modest figures, so a total of 9 million. Yet, I haven't heard a single argument made in any American media, any Western uh, intelligentsia platform anywhere in the world that says because these refugees have fled, so even if we accept the Israeli logic, these refugees have fled, they have no legal right whatsoever to go back home. Yet somehow they completely embrace that logic when the Zionists have made it. Supposedly, my grandparents have fled Bidaras to the Nusayrat refugee camp, and therefore they lose any legal right and any political right to make a claim that they deserve to be back in Bidaras. That only applies to the Palestinians, and somehow the rest of the so called international community kind of nods their heads, collective head, in agreement. This is very solid logic. Now, the logic, the logic of history is almost always constructed by Israel to the point that I have heard even in the global south, and this is a, a, a truly big problem, global south where there is so much solidarity, historic solidarity for Palestinians, you start seeing the language that Israel, the Zionists have used is somehow penetrating the, 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 the intellectual and the collective psyche of these societies. I have been asked by Arabs, why did Palestinians abandon their land, for example? I have been asked in a recent um, trip I've made to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Kenya, I've been asked by a young student, uh, why do Palestinians use uh, terrorism uh, to free their land? And, and the sad thing is that in Kenya and throughout Africa and throughout the global south, the tactics that what Palestinians use to liberate themselves is pretty much identical to the tactics and the strategies and the type of resistance used by all of these communities that they needed, you know, that in order for them to free themselves from British, French colonialism, and so forth. So this is why our role here is so, is so very important. When we talk about the need to reclaim our narrative and to reclaim our history, we are not, we are not just simply showing, you know, that we Palestinians are stubborn and we will never forget what has happened to us. This is important at an internal level, within an internal internal Palestinian conversation, for sure. But what also, uh, what what that also means, is that we are able to to re reimpose ourselves as part of that conversation and and to say that in order for justice or, or to be de truly defined it has to be defined based on palestinian priorities not the priorities of the zionist movement uh, not the priorities of israel and its obsession with security at the expense of the human rights and the very existence of the palestinian people but the priorities of the palestinians the refugees of the refugee camps, the Palestinians of Lebanon, of Jordan, the Palestinians of the West Bank, uh, the Palestinians of Palestine 48, uh, the Palestinians of, of, of America and Europe and so forth and so on. We need to find that collective voice and we need to claim our role in history so that it's not defined through the mil military ordinances of the Israeli army, uh, through Ben Gurion, through the Zionist movement, and through Bennett, Netanyahu, and the Israeli government. Now, when <clears throat> just to show you how keen Israel is on robbing Palestinians of their history and imposing 
the Israeli, uh, the fabricated Israeli Zionist alternative. After the Israeli occupation of whatever remained of Palestine, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza in 1967, numerous ordinances, hundreds of ordinances were passed by the Israeli army in order for them to control the Palestinian population in the newly occupied territories. Dozens of these ordinances focused on the issue of education. Palestinians could not teach their history to their children. I grew up in a refugee camp school in Nusayrat, ran by UNRWA, in which I had never experienced learning anything about Palestinian history. Now, mind you, when I was actually born in that refugee camp, some of the, the greatest history in the Middle East has taken place there. Uh, not far away from my house were some ancient Byzantine villages, ancient Roman temples, uh, ancient uh, Hyksos uh, uh, facilities and trenches and, 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 and all sorts of incredible history that actually happened there, leading us all the way, starting from the Canaanites at Canaaniyun, all the way to today's history but we were completely unaware of it. We knew that something incredible happened here, but we were not allowed to talk about it. What we were allowed to talk about is you study Egyptian history, you study uh, 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 the uh, ancient, uh, the stories of the pharaohs and, and, and all of that, but you're not allowed to study your own history because according to Israel, acknowledging the importance and significance of Palestinian history is a form of incitement. Needless to say, we were not even allowed to, to carry Palestinian flags. Children who used to paint flags on pieces of papers using crayons and would be caught would actually be imprisoned. And their families would have to pay a heavy fine uh, to release them from prison for that supposedly, uh, 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 you know, uh, violent, acts that jeopardize the very existence and the security of Israel. Uh, so as a result, some of our revolutionary teachers would try to kind of sneak bits and pieces of history when nobody is looking. Literally, I remember um, our one of my teachers, uh, Faris Abu Shawish, uh, in the, in the um, uh, I think it was in the um, ninth grade. You know, he was uh, he, he was a socialist. He was imprisoned by Israel, and he knew, like other teachers knew, that there is a war on our history. So he would literally start looking around to make sure that there is no Israeli soldiers snooping around the classroom or the school, or no collaborator, nobody is standing around. And then he would start whispering little things, and we would kind of lean over, and we just gathered that something incredible happened here, but we were not allowed to talk about it. Now, this trajectory continues until today. You hear once in a while, an Israeli law in the Knesset that passed to change, remove all the Arabic names of streets throughout Palestine and replace them with Hebrew and English names. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Israeli, uh, uh, what is it called? The um, uh, the the uh, the Israeli nation, uh, gosh, the name has escaped me. <clears throat> uh, is is the 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 law that passed in two thousand nineteen? I believe that kind of defines Israel exclusively as a Jewish state. Although Israel has always been defined as a Jewish state, this particular law, uh, the nation state law uh, of two thousand eighteen, intentionally removed any reference to the Arabic language, to Arabic culture, to Arabic history, and to the rights of the Palestinians who live on that land. The only right of self-determination is granted not only to Jews in Israel, but to Jews anywhere in the world. Complete erasure of the, of the Palestinian. The fact that we are actually a slight majority right now between the, the river and the sea makes no difference. I mean, this is the very definition of apartheid. This is the very definition of racism and not just any form of apartheid and not just any form of racism, a very gory, very sinister and very extreme interpretation of race 
uh, and, and, and the relationship between people based on racial preferences of the state. So this is what we are fighting against here. We are fighting to reclaim our history. We are fighting to reclaim our culture, but we are fighting against erasure. This is why storytelling is so very important. This is why Palestinian voices taking the center stage, and I'm talking about authentic Palestinian voices. I'm talking about Palestinian voices that truly represent Palestinian collectives, whether in Palestine itself or anywhere in the world. These, they are very, very essential to actually telling the story of their own people. And by doing so, they become a political reality. Honestly, you guys, and I don't think as young people, you should be accepting that. Do not be sitting in the audience and allow someone else to tell your story. Do not. Be, be unhappy about that. Take, be the, the one taking the center stage. Nobody, because as Edward Said has said, he said, history changes depending on what time that history is being told and who is telling that history. You see, so you can't lease your history because someone else might be more credible in the eyes of the American audience or the British audience. We've tried this. Believe me, we have. We've tried it for a long, long time. And we didn't really gain much as a result. Only when you take the center stage, only when you represent, truly represent your people, their political aspirations, their rights, and fight for justice, articulating it using your own priorities. Sometimes I even get slightly frustrated with my own colleagues for emphasizing, uh, for example, the similarities between Palestinian history and other histories in South Africa, for example, to the point that we are actually neglecting our own history. So don't delve too much in comparisons and, 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 and forget where you actually came from, you see? I remember I was talking to, to young people in Gaza. And as we know that Gaza is the heart of Palestinian resistance at this point, as it has been for a long time. But I was a little bit surprised that all of these young people were making references to events that happened in South Africa during the apartheid. And we know by our own comrades in South Africa that what Palestinians experience today by far exceed anything that the, the, the racist apartheid government in Pretoria has imposed on the people in South Africa. It, this is not an attempt at undermining that, that, that uh, catastrophe, that disaster that has happened there and the awful violence and racism that accompanied it, but not to the point that we actually neglect our own history. Even if you talk to Palestinian solidarity activists from say in, in Chicago, in New York, in London, and so forth. They, they will tell you about Israeli newspapers that they have read. They will tell you about an Israeli uh, anti-Zionist Israeli writer in Haaretz or somewhere else. But they know very little about our own writers, about our own newspapers, because it's like always this fear that Palestinians are a liability. Racism is so intense that the Palestinians have been marginalized sometimes by our own friends because we have no credibility, because the Zionists made it that way. As a result, you build your views and you fortify your argument and you present your, uh, uh, your political stances based on what this anti-Zionist writer said in Israel or somewhere else. But it doesn't work that way. No national liberation movement you guys, anywhere in the world has ever succeeded, and I mean truly succeeded, in ridding itself of military occupation, of apartheid, of racism and colonialism without them basing their struggle on the authentic political and historic uh, and artistic and cultural priorities of their own people. So as long as we fail at reclaiming that, as long as we have a problem. Now, um, I don't know how long I've been talking for, uh, but uh, I, I, I just want to say, um, I just want to say something very quick about the book. And, and really, I usually I'm not very good at, um, at, at promotion of any kind. In fact, my father used to be, um, used to do business. I mean, he called himself a businessman, but in the refugee camp, believe me, nobody is a businessman. 
And he used to say, Ramsey, when I used to help him in the market selling, you know, uh, whatever cheap stuff he used to buy, uh, I was so bad at it. You know, my everybody would be standing, you know, jumping up and down with, you know, come on, women of the camp and buy this and that. And I would be standing there extremely shy, just looking at people folding my arms in front of me because I was so bad at, you know, presenting the product. So, but I am going to dare here and say something about this latest book, our vision for liberation. And I know that you are going to be putting a, a picture of it. Now, I am particularly proud of this book. I'm particularly proud of it because it is based on years, not just of research, but also frustration that I felt that we, wherever I went in the world, and I have spoken in over 40 countries, and wherever I went, there is always a brilliant Palestinian somewhere, a brilliant Palestinian. And sometimes they are, you know, a, you know university professors, academics, writers, uh, filmmakers, singers, people who are very much Palestinians, but very much uh, involved in their own communities, whether they are in Madrid or in Santiago, Chile, or in London, or in uh, Morocco, or in Qatar, or in Turkey. Yet we don't know about them. We don't know. We don't have a conversation, a collective conversation that we Palestinians talk with one another. Usually, whenever there's the Palestinian collective element, it's always based on some kind of a factional paradigm. Hamas, Fatah, this and that. But where is the Palestinian that exists independent from all of this? The Palestinian that is fighting for his people in whatever language, in whatever geography. In... So I had this idea of what if we bring these Palestinians together? And to try to think, not just offer political interpretation to the situation, but rather everyone speaks in his own field in which he or she um, has excelled and has achieved uh, great things based on the idea that they have to be engaged intellectuals. Now, the difference between the engaged intellectual and the disengaged intellectual, based on the writings of the anti-fascist Italian a uh, uh, historian and, and, and activist, Antonio Gramsci, who himself was, was more or less killed by the fascists, by Miss Mussolini in the, in the uh, 1930s, is that the engaged intellectual is someone who is living the experience. He's not just preaching, but he's actually fighting for what he's preaching, and he's on the front line, the front lines of whatever he or she is fighting for. And I initially, I thought, what if we can't find enough Palestinians to cover the numerous subjects that we want to discuss, to offer if a true vision for a Palestinian future, one that exceeds the political, um, uh, the, the existing political hindrances, the factional fight in fighting, so forth and so on. But the problem was actually the exact opposite. We found way too many Palestinians, Palestinian engaged Palestinian intellectuals in Palestine and throughout the world who can actually address every single topic. So we spent a long time just trying to decide on who is gonna be that single Palestinian to talk about that single topic. At the end, we ended up with 30 engaged Palestinian intellectuals and we divided the vision of Palestinian future to 30 different topics. They include Oscar nominated filmmakers, great uh, historians, diplomats, uh, art singers, uh, um, people who have uh, fought for Palestinian rights, uh, like for example, Kinder USA, uh, the, the really the main Palestinian organization in the US that's channeling charity, uh, and not just any kind of charity, but the kind of charity that brings empowerment to Palestinian communities, uh, maintain their sense of dignity, and so many other subjects and so many other people. And the question is, the question is, how do we, how do we present all of this within a paradigm of this is our collective vision as engaged Palestinian intellectuals all over the world? So this is kind of 
taking the, the idea of reclaiming the narrative and reclaiming history and being at the center of that history and the center of the political discourse a step further by actually producing documents, by producing documents and talking directly with one another. So the result of this is our book, um, our uh, vision for liberation. Uh, I was actually hoping to read a, a short preface um, uh, or uh, like a short uh, text from it. Would that be okay? Yeah, I would love that, yes. Okay, if I have time. Okay, perfect. So our vision for liberation is our attempt to offer a new way of looking at Palestinian liberation. For the kind of liberation championed in this book to succeed, the Palestinian people must be pl uh, placed at its core and truly engaged Palestinians must take center stage, not only to convey the victimization of their people, and that's another major issue here, that Palestinians should not exist in the Palestinian political discourse as mere victims. Yes, we are victims of Zionism, but there's one thing that you kind of allocate that role for yourself and be satisfied with it, and using that, that victimization to actually fight back with uh, and resist and to have an actual vision for liberation for your people. So it's not only to convey the victimization of their people, but also to mobilize and empower them as well. Such engaged, engaged Palestinians are also critical to the international solidarity movement. Solidarity that is not guided by authentic Palestinian voices is simply futile. It cannot reflect the true desires of the Palestinian people and therefore cannot effectively mobilize what is most essential, their support. I will stop at here. I hope I did not uh, exceed my time. And I would love to hear uh, some of your comments, questions, and feedback. Thank you so much, Dr. Barud. Um, you know, it's, it's always great to hear the perspective of you know, per personally, as someone in America and a student living his whole life in America and a Palestinian living in the diaspora, it's always important and amazing to hear the perspective of people actually doing the work back home. So thank you again for everything that you just said. And um, now we'll transition into our Q&A portion. So we have a couple questions from the chat. So the first one is, while the Palestinian narrative is making headway among the fringes of world societies, but has continued to recede among the ruling elites of the world, and even among the ruling elites of the Arab political system. So I, I think essentially the question is, uh, why, why is that so? Um, that is it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And, and the answer to that is because the rights of people that is kind of bereft of geopolitical interest, economic uh, leverage, uh, uh, you know, political power, doesn't usually um, coincide with the interest of ruling elites. This not is only applicable in the case of Palestine, frankly. It's applicable in any case. Any national struggle throughout history, modern and ancient, um, is, uh, if it's not exploited by the ruling elites, it's irrelevant if it doesn't serve their interest. Um, this is why not only, I mean, we talk about now, it's obvious that Oslo and the Oslo Accords and the so-called peace process was, was, you know, wrote disasters for Palestinians. We, you know, I mean, that needs a whole different um, conference just for that discussion. But one thing it has actually done, it has uh, affected the Palestinian narrative in, in profound ways and in, in, in terrible ways, in the sense that it, it gave us as Palestinians this appearance that we are now part of a political discussion that is happening at the highest levels of society, uh, from uh, Oslo, from Madrid to Oslo, to Washington DC, to London, to Paris, you know, the Paris Protocol and all of this. Um, and in doing so, we kind of really start buying into this notion that my goodness, look at us, we have a national anthem, uh, we have a particular political discourse, uh, 
very guarded, very cautious, completely uh, empty of the old nationalistic fervor that unified the Palestinian people for many years, but nonetheless a unique Palestinian position. And, and we dress up in suits and ties and we, you know, and we walk on red carpets wherever we go. But in the process of doing so, not only we actually achieved zero, nil, nothing, as far as having greater geopolitical advantage, but we also lost that, that historic uh, uh, connection that we've had to societies all over the world, uh, all over, um, and, and, and it's really sad. I mean, I keep bringing the, the global South back. I mean, historically, if it were not for our, the solidarity we received in the global South, you know, you know that it was actually the African Union that, uni that, that defined, first defined Zionism as a form of racism. And then they kind of pushed and lobbied at the General Assembly, at the United Nations, forcing the entire world to accept the definition that Zionism is a form of racism. It wasn't even the Arabs, it was the Africans. And now look what's happening in Africa. Many African countries have excellent relationship with Israel and they are opening up uh, their, their economies and they are uh, admitted Israel as an observer, member of the African Union. How did we lose Africa? How did we lose Asia? How did we lose South America? Uh, because of that, because focusing on, on making ourselves more amiable to the political elites, in Oslo and Madrid and London and Washington DC, um, but while losing the support of grassroots societies throughout the world. Now, the good news is that we are recovering from that and we are recovering quite fast actually. You know, what you see the success of the, the, of the boycott movement, everywhere you go, it's starting real conversation, putting Palestine on the agenda, you have numerous groups in numerous localities all over the world being part of the conversation on Palestine and pushing for a clear and decided Palestinian agenda. So we are recovering from that, but we should worry very, very little about the support of the political elites um, at this stage until we are able to create that critical mass of support all around the world. The moment we have that critical mass, the politicians will have no other options but kind of toe the line and, and, and you know, stand in solidarity with Palestinians. We've seen the same thing happen in South Africa. It was people all around the world that stood against apartheid, but then ultimately it was the Americans and the British, Thatcher and, and Reagan, who were brought into the celebration of the end of apartheid, kicking and screaming. They thought that, uh, in fact, they, not only did they actually think that Nelson Mandela was a terrorist, they defined him as a terrorist in, in American and British laws. And Nelson Mandela, even though he was, he left prison, uh, uh, Reuben Island in the early 1990s, he actually was not removed from the Congress's list of terrorism until I think 2008, like 15, 16, 17 years later. Legally, Mandela was still recognized as a terrorist by the American ruling classes for years and years. So this should not be our focus at that time. It never works that way for national liberation movement. Just stay the course, keep building strong support within civil society organizations, keep pushing for new definitions like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, these new definitions that Israel is an outright apartheid state. This is absolutely critical to the Palestinian narrative. Take that new literature, these new ideas, this new narrative, and keep expanding the circle of support for Palestinians around the world. And I promise you, it will be the matter of time before politicians and ruling classes would have to acknowledge this new reality sooner or later. Thank you for the really insightful uh, response to that question. Um, we have some more questions um, and this next one, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on it um, as a Students for Justice in Palestine organizer. Um, so how do you recommend Rebalance wanting to bring non-Palestinians into Palestinian organizing and educational spaces while still centering Palestinian voices? 
especially when not many Palestinians, at least in the US, are as involved in organizations or groups such as Students for Justice in Palestine or coalition spaces. I, I have to apologize to you, Sana. There's some connection issues and I couldn't hear that question very well. Uh, were you reading from the, the, chat, uh, the chat space? Um, Maybe I, 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 I have a, a document up with it in there. Do you want, can you hear me okay, guys? Okay, let's, let's try this again, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, how do you recommend rebalance wanting to bring non-Palestinians into Palestinian organizing and educational spaces while still centering Palestinian voices, especially when not many Palestinians, at least in the US, are as involved in organizations or groups such as Students for Justice in Palestine or coalition spaces? Absolutely, it's, it's an excellent question. And it's, it's a strategic question as well, because indeed in some, in some uh, communities and some societies, and I've been to many of these communities around the world, quite often you go to a university that has uh, very solid support for Palestine coming from a Palestinian, uh, pro-Palestine group. And sometimes maybe you have only a single Palestinian student, you know, because it's an isolated town somewhere in Southern New Zealand or in, you know, some places I visited in Alaska. What do you do? What do you do in this situation? I think, I think there are two things can, that can be done. First, this, the, 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 the mindset itself, the mindset itself. Um, you could be in, 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 in a city or in a university or in any academic platform or even spiritual religious platform, and you could have a million Palestinian and somehow Palestinians are still being told what to do. And sometimes you could be in situations where you have a community with very few Palestinians, yet somehow the Palestinian, Palestinian political discourse and priorities are being respected. That's what I mean by the mindset. Um, I have um, been in com to conferences in which you have entire platforms talking about the Nakba and not a single Palestinian there. So how is that even possible? How can, how can, can he, he, like three white people, and I really don't like to infuse race uh, too much in every, in every political discourse, but how can be three white intellectuals sitting on a platform talking about the, the experience of slavery and what black people go through in this country? or um, uh, three people from a different race talking about the, 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 the mistreatment of, of uh, uh, migrants and refugees coming from South America. So this is very, very important. The mindset itself has to respect the priorities of these people. So, and that can be done. Now you would say, but maybe there is no such thing as a Palestinian frame of reference. And I've seen this, I've been told this a lot. And I feel like it's kind of, often used as some kind of, um, uh, as, a, as a pretense, really, more than anything else. Uh, what I mean by this is, well, you know, Ramzi, Hamas and Fatah are always fighting, and uh, you tell us Palestinian priorities, but where are the Palestinians are always fighting, you know? Well, two things. Number one, every national liberation movement from South Africa to, Niger to Algeria, to Nigeria, to Vietnam and Korea is always been not only fighting, but sometimes outright civil wars. So please do not make us to be this hideous exception to all the beautiful, you know, anti-colonial movements in the world. It's just not true at all. We are by, by no means the exception. The second thing, we do have a movement called the, the BDS movement, boycott, divestment and sanctions. And, and it has tons of literature coming out of it. We have numerous Palestinian human rights groups from Al-Haq to Mizan to so many others that have very clearly uh, uh, articulated Palestinian discourse and priorities, whether uh, Abdamir in support of prisoners, Al-Haq uh, referencing issues pertaining to human rights, uh, again, BDS and so forth. And you have so many Palestinian intellectuals and writers who articulate uh, Palestinian realities and Palestinian vision, I think that should be more than enough for them to be the guide uh, and, and the intellectual base for any movement anywhere in the world. Now, based on that, we have to, everyone has to know his place in the movement. The, it, it, this is solidarity with the Palestinian people. 
It can't be a solidarity that sidelines the Palestinian people or solidarity that marginalizes the Palestinian people. Palestinian people cannot be sitting in the audience always clapping for someone else, speaking on behalf of the Palestinian people. That kind of solidarity completely mixes up the priorities and confuses the priorities altogether. So Palestine has to be, a, now when I say Palestinians have to be at the center state, just because one is a Palestinian doesn't give that person you know, this kind of um, uh, unhindered power to make any claim on behalf of the Palestinian people. Even the likes of myself and so many others, we still have to have a frame of reference. We still have to have a frame of reference. Our frame of reference, of course, should not be Oslo and the Oslo peace process, the priorities of the Palestinian ruling elites in Ramallah or the factional priorities within Gaza and Ramallah. That frame of reference should be the rights of the Palestinian people as enshrined in their history, in their struggle, in their resistance, in the massive amount of literature coming from Palestine, and of course, in international law. As long as we are clear on, on how, how this narrative has to be constructed, honestly, even if the one presenting this information is a non-Palestinian, it really doesn't matter a great deal. So it all depends on the nature of the situation and, 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 and the fact that are we truly adhering to Palestinian priorities, or we are adhering to self-interest and 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 uh, uh, political expedience wherever we are in the world. Thank you, Dr. Barut. Um, next question is: uh, What is your perspective on the Palestinian Authority leadership and its role as protector of the settlers and working on shutting down resistance against the brutal occupation? what can be done to change this terrible situation? And second part to that is, do you think that the current Palestinian political system should be dismantled? Absolutely, it's, it's, it's an excellent question and a difficult question at the same time. It should be obvious, it should be obvious. And I don't think we are even at a stage where we need to start kind of counting the pros and cons of the Palestinian Authority. We played that game a long time ago and, and, and at the end of the day, the Palestinian Authority proved not only it's not a, a, a Palestinian leadership or a, in any way a democratic representation of the Palestinian people, uh, but a huge liability on the Palestinian people. And that is really, uh, the, that was the topic of one recent article I wrote about the coming stage of the Palestinian anti-apartheid struggle being the most difficult. And the reason that I made the argument that it is the most difficult because now you have to contend with the reality that you are not only fighting Israel, you are fighting the corruption from within. Many Palestinian prisoners and another shameless self-promotion um, in, in the book about prisoners, I wrote these chains would be broken. Well, I didn't write it. Actually, the prisoners wrote it. Many of the prisoners I interviewed trying to kind of get, you know, what is the narrative of the Palestinian prison beyond victimization? What is their political ideas? What's their story? And what's the common ground in their narrative? And one thing that many of them had in common, that they were arrested twice by the Palestinian Authority, by Israel. Several of them were tortured by the Palestinian Authority and by Israel. Now, if you reach a point that the finest of your people, men or women, uh, regardless of their political background, being Fatah, being Hamas, being socialist, being whatever, have been tortured by your leadership in order for them to exact information on behalf of Israel, there is no conversation there. I'm sorry, but there's no leadership here. And we need to think past that. We need to think beyond that. Um, and that's why it is the most difficult, because now if you go to protest in Ramallah, the Palestinian police is going to come after you the Palestinian so-called security, which has been trained by the Americans and by the Jordanians and by the Egyptians and other uh, you know, corrupt Arab regimes. How do you deal with that issue? Fighting with your own people in order for you to have the right to fight against the Israeli uh, occupier. Um, so it, it is not an easy situation and it really requires some serious conversation. And wherever, like I remember recently, actually I was in Istanbul and there was a Palestinian, an ex-minister of the Palestinian Authority. And when I called for the dismantling of the Palestinian Authority, he was so upset. He stood up through the papers and just walked off stage. So, so we can't talk about the dismantling of the Palestinian Authority, 
But at the same time, we understand that the Palestinian Authority is a hindrance to the struggle of the Palestinian people. What is this dichotomy? How do we deal with it? Now, I'm hoping that two things can happen. Number one, you have an incredible new generation in Palestine. And it's really, this is not about, you know, just what happened last May and this kind of the new youthful euphoria that's coming out of Palestine from Sheikh Jarrah to Gaza to Haifa to uh, 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 Nablus and so forth. No, there is something deep and profound that goes beyond what happened in May. That there is a new language that is being articulated by these young people. There is a new degree of dareness and bravery um, and, and, and realization that we have to have a complete reset in our struggle. And I have faith that this new generation will figure out a way to overcome this obstacle of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, so, so that's one thing. The other thing, I am hoping that we start actually engaging in conversations, uh, uh, Palestinian intellectuals all over the world, start engaging in conversations beyond the, 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 the factional definition of the character of the Palestinian Authority but rather start thinking of the Palestinian Authority as a problem. It has been imposed on us from the outside. We had to, sub we had to survive somehow because believe it or not, the Palestinian Authority are, is the largest employer in Palestine without the money that's coming from the Americans and the so-called donor countries through the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and it's paying the, for this massive security apparatus and all sorts of jobs created by the Palestinian Authority just to keep Palestinian resistance at bay. If, if you don't have this existing structure, you are going to have a major issue, economic issue and depression in Palestine. Now, any resistance movement would say, well, I mean, that's the price of any anti-colonial struggle. Why should Palestinians be so concerned on some money uh, being you know, charity handed out to them by the Saudis or the Americans or the Japanese? They should think beyond that anyway. And I agree. But because I am not in Palestine myself and I do not get uh, paid by the Palestinian Authority and my children are not surviving on my salary coming from the Palestinian Authority, I feel like that's a decision that would have to be made by the Palestinians themselves in the West Bank, in Gaza, and elsewhere. The sad reality is that the, the, this charity of the Palestinian Authority, this large conglomerate, uh, of, of, of money and funds that offers to the donor countries is actually being used to twist the arms of the Palestinian people. Whenever they misbehave themselves in Gaza, whenever they resist, uh, Mahmoud Abbas basically cuts off the money that goes to Palestinian workers in Gaza or half the money that's going to prisoners and so forth and so on, so that they will continue basically to toe the Palestinian Authority line. So we know, we know that we have a major issue here and we, ha we, we have to overcome this issue in order for the Palestinian people to think about the next stage of their struggle. We can't wish it away and we can't pretend that it's not there, but how can it be done in a way that does not entirely destabilize the Palestinian uh, society is a question that requires a lot of investigation, a lot of discussion, and has to engage Palestinians and Palestine itself. Thank you. Um, we have one more question. Um, so do you see international law and human rights as a tool for Palestinian liberation? Um, it's yes and no. I mean, international law has existed uh, and has acknowledged the United Nations uh, Charter and uh, you know, founding principles, uh, human rights charter and so forth and so on. These things have always existed. And they have existed uh, uh, in, you know, when Israel was carrying out all sorts of ethnic cleansing, when Israel carried every massacre, uh, carried out every massacre against the Palestinian people, uh, when Israel destroyed hundreds of Palestinian villages, when Israel occupied uh, uh, the West Bank and Gaza, built illegal settlements by in violations of international law, brought its illegal settlers to Palestine, armed them. Uh, uh, and, and slowly began what Iran Pape refers to as uh, uh, incremental genocide against the Palestinians. Uh, these things have always existed. The problem is not the lack of their existence. Uh, the problem is the lack of the implementation. 
or to understanding that the, what's happening in Palestine is actually deserving of the implementation of these laws. Now, as long as you have an American veto, as long as you have uh, total American support for Israel, as long as they will always find a way out for Israel, and they have. I mean, what's happening at the International Criminal Court right now of trying to hold Israel accountable, for years we have been after the ICC to even accept the Palestinian file, to even acknowledge that Palestinians have a case against Israel, that Israel committed some kind of war crimes at one point in the last 75 years. And years and years and years and years, and we're not quite there yet. We don't have any investigators in Palestine yet. And I don't know how long they are gonna stretch, stretch this. And I don't know what will it take for it to actually be, to happen. And if it does happen, will, will these decisions be enforced in any way? But within hours of the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, within hours, the ICC started a file and, 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 and began the legal procedure of recognizing what Russia is doing in Ukraine as war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, crimes of aggression. You don't even need to put a case there. The judges just came from their own, you know, uh, based on their own volition and they come up with this, all of these things, no problem, no hindrances, no questions asked. So, so imagine how, when it comes to Palestinians, how delayed the process of getting you know, uh, our rights recognized by international law, not only to be implemented, to even be recognized or applicable to the Palestinian case, compare this to many other conflicts that serves the interests of the United States, Europe, NATO, Israel, and so forth. They are so very quick to reach judgments regarding this issue. So yes, um, Palestinians have to fight through these channels. But of course, we should not expect that that fight in itself is going to deliver justice for the Palestinian people. Eventually it could, in fact it will, but it has to be a component of so many other struggles all happening at the same time. And we should not be holding our breath that the West is gonna hold Israel accountable simply because we have managed successfully to argue a strong case for Palestinians whether at the General Assembly, at the Security Council, at the ICC, at the International Court of Justice. That's not gonna happen. The US will block that from happening. So we need to keep fighting at that front, but at the same time, opening so many fronts until we reach what I referred to earlier as that critical mass. Once you have a critical mass of support for Palestinians around the world, not just in the West, but around the world, it will be the moment that this apartheid regime will slowly start getting dismantled. Then that's when international law and humanitarian law will become even more relevant in the case of Palestine. Thank you so much, Dr. Barud. Um, that was our last question for the day. Um, just uh, something that was brought up in the chat. Uh, we were looking forward, if, if it's possible, to plan more workshops and to have you come speak much more often because uh, we've enjoyed having you so much and we've enjoyed your conversation so much. So obviously uh, Abir will be reaching out to you and uh, hopefully we'll be able to plan something like this again in the future, multiple in, in multiple instances. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Barud for taking the time um, and thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, I would like to sincerely thank ET Staffing and Consulting LLC for being a sponsor of our conference. Uh, they specialize in engineering recruitment and staffing in the medical device and pharma industries, and they place engineers at contact and full-time based on our clients' requirements. So please check them out if interested. Um, we're also going to have a quick trivia question for everyone. So if you can... Um, we're gonna put it in the chat and the first person to answer the question correctly will be able to win a free t-shirt like the one that's shown on the screen. Um, thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Barud. Uh, we will be sending all the links for your book and for his website. So please everyone check out the book, buy the book, read the book. And um, that's all we have. I'd like to give it back to Abir. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Baroud, so much. I just want to echo the things like this was a 
personally a very val uh, very validating talk that I need to hear. So I really want to thank you for everything that you shared um, in such a powerful way. And I'm sure everyone else, and hopefully you can see all the comments thanking you for um, all the wisdom that you've shared. And I will definitely be reaching out um, to do some more. I saw that um, Reverend Fahid put in the chat, you know, requested for us to do more of these. So um, hopefully we can stay connected. Um, and I really want to thank Barry and Senna for doing such a great job moderating this and for all your organizing efforts at SJP at New Brunswick. If any of you are interested in joining any SJP or any Palestine organizing, um, please, uh, and you need some help doing that, please reach out to us. Um, but again, if we can all just collectively thank Dr. Barut for that great talk. Um, and please don't go anywhere. We are going to take a short break and we're going to be right back um, with a panel about healing. And, and, you know, healing is a very important conversation that is not had enough when talking about Palestine. So we're going to be joined by two licensed psychologists um, to talk about how Palestinians and our communities can heal together. So we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Allah yikhalik shukran diya. Bye, Khalid, Mustafa.